Everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today, and we're continuing on in our series about cell division. Topic for the day is going to be basics of inheritance. The things we talk about today are going to serve as a foundation for some of the videos we got coming up. So let's go ahead and get into it with our objectives. First thing you need to be able to know or do by the end of this video is to be able to explain the role of a gene in inheritance. Second thing, understand the basic roles and behaviors of chromosomes. And finally, you need to be able to describe the concept of alternation of generation. Now I'm gonna warn you, today is going to be a very vocabulary heavy um, video, but a lot of the vocabulary is really important because we're gonna use it throughout the rest of this series. So first thing that you need to know is that genes are responsible for the inheritance of traits. If you ever hear that you know, you've know you got mom's eyes or dad's nose or whatever else, obviously they didn't give you their eyes or their nose. They gave you a trait that gave your body the ability to produce those eyes or nose or whatever. You can kind of think about it as what your brain does when you read a book. So you're reading through a book and you see the word dog. Your brain conjures up an image of a dog. In the same way, our genes, which are code, so they are a sequence of bases, A, C, T, G. That code, when your body gets a hold of that, reads that information and then builds the trait that is correlated with that uh, code that is just read. So kind of like your brain comes up with a mental image after you see a word, your body comes up with a trait after it reads the code carried in a gene. Um, also know that genes are inherited from parents, obviously. So for each trait, and we'll talk about this more later, but for each trait, whether it's eye color, nose, whatever, you get one gene from mom, one gene from dad, and then based on whether that gene is dominant or recessive, which we'll talk about later, the gene will show up in your body. So a gene is just the instructions to produce a specific protein, and those proteins are then responsible for the traits that are expressed in your body. Gametes are sex cells, so sperm or eggs are gametes, and we'll talk more about them later on. You need to know somatic cells as different from gametes. Somatic cells are all of the other cells in your body. Somatic cells have got a full set of genetic information, so in the case of humans, somatic cells have got 46 chromosomes, and gametes have got 23 chromosomes. Now, Every species on the face of this earth has got a different number of chromosomes that are found in its somatic cells and its gametes, but know that gametes always have half the chromosomes of a somatic cell. A locus is a spot on a chromosome where a gene is found, so it's kind of like the address. Genes for specific traits will always be found in the same spot on the same chromosome consistently throughout a species. So let's say the gene for eye color, there are several genes for eye color, but just for the sake of simplicity, the gene for eye color might be found on chromosome 21 in humans, about two thirds of the way from the bottom. If that's where it's found there, it will be found there in all humans. So the location is the address of a gene on a chromosome. And finally, asexual versus sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is a mode of reproduction that produces exact copies. They are genetically identical to each other. A lot of single-celled organisms go through this type of reproduction. There is no mixing of genes from outside participants or partners. You're just producing an exact clone of yourself. In sexual reproduction, there is the mixing together of genetic material from two different individuals. So no asexual, no mixing of genetic material. Sexual, you're bringing together two different sets of genetic material. Let's talk about chromosomes for just a little bit. When chromosomes are in, I don't know, the tangled up state known as chromatin, they're not really visible. But as we talked about in the cell cycle, before the cell gets ready to divide, when it's in prophase, all that messy chromatin spaghetti condenses down into nice, tightly coiled, X-shaped chromosomes. Those chromosomes during prophase can be visualized using dyes and pictures and things like that. And then they can be put together into what is called a karyotype. You can see there on the right, a karyotype. What a karyotype is, is it's a visual picture of all of the chromosomes. And the chromosomes are matched up according to similarities. So chromosome one is matched up with its partner, chromosome one. You can see chromosome two, three, four, five. Each number of chromosome is different 
from all of the others. So know that a karyotype is a way to visualize chromosomes. When scientists are putting together a karyotype, they pair up homologous chromosomes. Now, know that in science, homo always means same. So in this case, we are talking about same chromosomes. I've blown up the karyotype here, and you can see here is chromosome number one, and they are showing you a karyotype that has two homologous chromosomes. So this is going to be after duplication, or uh, yeah, after replication um, in S phase, you have got both of these as being chromosome number one. They are homologous. They are the same as one another. But notice that each one consists of a set of chromatids, and they are identical to each other. So you can see that when they're stained, that would represent one gene. This would represent another gene, another gene, etc. So they're matched up. In the human body, this chromosome might be for mom, this chromosome might be for dad. So you would have like mom's gene for eye color right here and dad's gene for eye color right there. So know that homologous chromosomes are identical to each other in that they've got these same genes on them, but it's possible that this might be a gene for brown eyes, this might be a gene for blue eyes. And a set of homologous chromosomes has each individual chromosome having two sister chromatids. Hopefully you were able to follow all those words. Also with chromosomes, you need to know the difference between a sex chromosome and an autosome. If you look at a karyotype, it's very easy to tell. Your sex chromosomes are pair number 23. This is an X chromosome that is for female. This is a Y chromosome that is for male. Sorry guys, we get the stumpy little chromosomes. But if you look at these as compared to all of the others, you'll notice that the X chromosome is quite a bit bigger than most of the other chromosomes and the Y is quite a bit smaller. This X and Y is what determines the sex of an organism for humans. If there are two X chromosomes, it's female. If there's an X and a Y, it is male. And as we continue on with our vocabulary, you need to know the difference between haploid and diploid. The only cells in our bodies that are haploid are the sex cells. So if you're a guy, you got haploid sperm. If you're a girl, you got haploid eggs. This just means like by haploid, we mean that that cell only has one copy of a specific gene or chromosome in it. A diploid has got two copies. So you can see here, egg has got one copy of the gene capital A. Sperm has got one copy of the same gene, except for it has a little a instead of a capital A. When these two come together in fertilization, the diploid cell has got the big A and the little a. I know that these haploid cells are traditionally represented as N, and a diploid cell is represented as being 2N. Now, in future videos, we're going to talk about the need for meiosis, but you can see it pretty clearly here. Our bodies need to maintain a set of 46 chromosomes. If these cells were diploid, after fertilization, we would have 92 chromosomes instead of the 46 that our body operates on. So just kind of as a recap, haploid has one chromosome or one gene for each trait. Diploid has got two genes for each trait. Final topic for the day, alternation of generation. Alternation of generation is just talking about the process that your body goes through to maintain a consistent number of chromosomes, and it varies based on organisms. So the way that this works, on the right there you've got the example of humans, and this is how most animals would work. You have got mother, father, they through meiosis produce haploid sperm and eggs. Those sperm and egg fertilize to form a diploid zygote. That zygote goes through mitosis to form the juvenile, which will continue to go through mitosis to form the adult. And then those adults use meiosis to produce sperm and egg again. So this is the most common life cycle in animals. You are diploid for most of your life. The only point in your life cycle where you are haploid is when you are sperm or an egg. Now, this is not always the rule. I've got a quick little comparison here. You can see on the far right, we have got the animal scenario that we were just talking about, where you are diploid 2N 
for most of your life. So growing through mitosis, 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 mitosis. You go through meiosis to make your gametes. That would be your sperm and egg. That is the only point in the cycle where you are haploid. Those sperm and egg immediately fertilize, forming a diploid zygote, which will go through mitosis. Now, let's compare this to a couple other life cycles. For a lot of fungi, they actually spend most of their life as a haploid individual. So here's the way their life would go. You got the mature organism, which is in. All of the cells in that organism actually have only got one set of chromosomes. Through mitosis, they produce gametes. Those gametes fertilize, forming the zygote, which is 2N. That zygote then immediately goes through mitosis and goes back to being or not mitosis, it immediately goes through meiosis and goes back to being haploid. So no, for our fungi, the only time that fungi are diploid is when they're a zygote. That zygote immediately goes through meiosis, cuts its genetic material in half, and then it goes through mitosis. Those cells go through mitosis to form the mature haploid organism. A lot of plants, they flip-flop between the two. So we'll start here with our gametes, they're both haploid. They fertilize to form a zygote. That zygote will then go through mitosis to form a mature sporophyte, which is diploid. That sporophyte will then go through meiosis, forming spores. Those spores are haploid. The spores go through mitosis to form a gametophyte, which is also haploid. That gametophyte goes through mitosis to give us gametes and they fertilize and go around through the cycle again. So out of all that mess, the thing I want you to realize is that if the organism is just getting bigger, it's going through mitosis to produce more cells that are exact copies. If that organism needs to cut the genetic material in half, it goes through meiosis. I know that was a lot of vocabulary today. I hope that you were able to keep track of it. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you again.